everybody. It's a pleasure to see everybody. We have a good crowd tonight. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm going to assume it's good. <laughs> so it's uh, nice to see everybody out this evening. I'll call the uh, June 7th meeting of the Temple Terrace City Council to order. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody to please silence your electronic devices, and that includes us. So, um, and if you would, our vice mayor is now going to lead us in the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Heavenly Father, as we gather tonight to handle the business of our city, we thank you for the very many blessings you bestow upon us each and every day, for our health and our happinesses, for our successes and for our failures, that we may learn from them both. We look, for, we look for your guidance for this council to do the next right thing. Guide us on the decisions we make, both large and small, that we will always do what is right and just. We ask for your grace on all the employees of our city and for the protection of our first responders who serve and protect our fellow citizens. We ask these blessings in all the many different names as you are known, but in your most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Mayor. Very well done. Eloquent. Thank you. Um, first item of business, uh, I'd like to call Ms. Shelby Alinsky to the podium, please. <clears throat> Welcome, ma'am. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for coming. So, Tonight we have a, a very uh, happy proclamation for um, Community Garden Week. And so we have, I see some of your colleagues are here with you today, a little moral support. So um, the proclamation reads, whereas in 2020, an urban community garden, in 2012, I'm sorry, an urban community garden was created at River Hills Park in Temple Terrace, utilizing a combination of city property and citizen involvement turning the space into a productive garden that benefits the community, adding to the quality of life of our citizens by providing opportunities for exercise, social engagement, fresh and nutritious food, and providing education on the art of gardening and the pleasure it can bring. And whereas the Temple Terrace Community Garden Planning Committee has turned one space into three to include a teaching garden at Greco Middle School uh, and a fruit forest at Linwood Park. And community gardens are normally located in urban areas and can vary to include fruits, vegetables, herbs, plants, flowers. Larger areas are cultivated for land preservation with the goal of maintaining the natural beauty and the environment. Gardeners have a passion for nurturing the beauty and resources of the earth, and they produce food which feeds and sustains their families and our citizens. So therefore, I'm proud by the virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of City of Temple Terrace to proclaim June 5th through 11th as Community Garden Week in Temple Terrace. <laughs> Shelby, would you like to say a few words? Sure, yeah. All right. It was once said that to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. Thanks to the generosity of the city of Temple Terrace, we have been able to cultivate not one, but three beautiful gardens where folks around Temple Terrace and beyond come together to learn, to engage, to try their hand at growing their own food, planting their little piece of hope. In my time with the Temple Terrace Community Garden, I have had the privilege to meet so many amazing people who come together to <coughs> tend to these three special spaces. It takes a lot of hands to care for three community gardens, to maintain them, to grow them. Our continued success would not be possible without the dedication of so many people. Over these 10 years, friendships have been made, skills have been shared, food has been grown, and community built. I look forward to more work days at Greco, blueberry pancake breakfasts at Linwood, and potlucks at Greco. If you'd like to learn more about us, please check out our website, templeterracecommunitygarden.org, or find our Facebook group. Thank you so much, and happy Community Garden Week. <laughs> yes, I'm with this group. By chance, is it okay if the other folks come up? Let's come up. Come I don't recognize these people. They're not in the gardening club. Y'all dressed up really great. All right, Lori, you got to herd the
cats here. So there we're going to see. Everybody has to squeeze in. You do know once you're in for the beginning of the meeting, you have to stay for the whole thing, right? <laughs> so I do want to say, when we do proclamations, because we're getting ready to do another one, I do want to let you know that it is normal for people to kind of leave when we get to the business section of the meeting, so don't feel like you have to sit for the whole thing. So, Next proclamation is missing. I do not have a proclamation. So, we do have some special guests here, however, and we'll just chat with them while we're waiting for the proclamation. So, Pastors Cole, would you like to approach the podium, please? Welcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a proclamation, although it's somewhat missing right now, but we're going to find it, and it is in recognition of Juneteenth. Yes, and so, I, um, I, many of us happen to know the story of Juneteenth, but, but I'd love to hear it from you if, you're, if you'd like to share it with us. You, I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, you, you'd probably be putting me on, on the slot. I, mean, I don't want to do that. Quite a bit of a spot. But I'm, I'll let my wife, who is uh, more of the historian in our family, yeah. uh, share more with you. But uh, I, I am really honored to be here for this. And I really believe that uh, it was a major day for, of course, for African Americans uh, as far as uh, the liberty and history in the United States. And so, but anyway, I'll let her share and uh, let her have something to say. Well, we're certainly honored. Welcome. Temple Terrace has been a part of our life for over 13 years, and um, we have our roots here in Temple Terrace. And so we're so honored um, for um, being able to receive this proclamation um, in reference to the Juneteenth um, National Independence Day recognized as a national holiday in the United States of America, again, commemorating um, the freedom of enslaved um, African Americans. And so it just shows the forward movement of our country and our nation as a whole, um, that we are all free. Um, and so we can all live together, work together, thrive together. And so again, it's such an honor and a privilege. Thank each and every one of you. And we certainly want to recognize and honor Chief um, Albano. Um, he's been an intricate part of our lives, of our church, in our community. And so whenever he has, you know, things going on or in Temple Terrace, we're always, you know, there to support. And so we certainly appreciate um, Chief Albano for this great um, honor. Well, we want to thank you for being here, too, and, and uh, it's always nice to see people in our community, and, and so it's great. And so um, I will tell the public a little bit about Juneteenth, if you don't mind. And, and, and so um, a lot of people are confused by what that this holiday means and what it stands for. They don't understand the connection between the Emancipation Proclamation and Juneteenth and how they work, you know, what, what's the difference. And so... Um, as many of you know, uh, when President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, <laughs> thank you, um, it was in the midst of the Civil War. Well, because the country was at war and certain states had seceded from the Union, they did not recognize the Emancipation Proclamation. And so even after the war, when General Lee surrendered to um, General Grant, and the war came to an end, there were pockets of the Confederacy who either A, didn't get the word, or B, more likely, just didn't observe it because the Union troops, thank you, hadn't reached where they were yet. And so, even though it was the law of the land and the Civil War was officially over, um, there were places, in, particularly in the West, where um, slavery still existed and was the daily practice. And it was at Galveston, Texas, where a Union general, an interesting story there, too, because um, General Grant hated this general, so it was kind of a little irony there. There was a battle between these two 
and the Union General arrived in Galveston, Texas, where they still had enslaved people because they hadn't um, honored the, the treaty, the surrender. And so the Union General there proclaimed um, all the enslaved people were then free. Um, and, and contrary to popular belief, that wasn't really the last pole of slavery, but it was the last big one. There were still some out west that the Union Army had to go and kind of clear that out too. So, so that's why we celebrate Juneteenth. So if there's any confusion about, well, I thought this happened earlier, legally it did. But in certain parts of the Confederate states, um, they didn't observe that. So that's why we celebrate this today. And it's a, really, it's a, it's a significant holiday. And, and uh, so, so thank you both for being here. And I do have the proclamation now. So, and it says, whereas Juneteenth, also known as the Juneteenth National Independence Day, represents a very important milestone in American history when our nation fulfilled its creed of being the land of the free. During the American Civil War, the Honorable Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of the United States, issued the Emancipation Proclamation on September 22, 1862, with an effective date of January 1, 1863. But as I just mentioned, the war was not over. On June 19, 1865, Union soldiers led by Major General Gordon Granger, the guy that General Grant hated, arrived in Galveston, Texas with news that the Civil War had ended and that the slaves were free. This event has come to be known as Juneteenth, which is a linguistic blend of the words June and 19th, and was adopted to commemorate this historical and pivotal date in American history. Uh, now therefore I, Handy Ross, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of Temple Terrace, do hereby proclaim June 19th as Juneteenth National Independence Day. So thank you for being here. So we, we do have two history teachers here on the dais. Did I do okay with this? Next item of business, um, or there's the two next items, uh, are the Firefighters Pension Board trustee appointment of, the Firefighters Pension Board is the next item and the Police Pension Board is the one after. And so prior to that, I'd like the city attorney to have a few moments to explain some legal uh, opinion with the council and the public before we take action on this. <coughs> Um, I just wanted to state that um, assuming that a motion is going to be made to appoint uh, Mayor Ross to the Firefighters Pension Board, and this will also apply to the next item with the Police, uh, police Officer Pension Board, um, so that there uh, is not any question about dual office holding, um, that when the motion is made that it be made to appoint him ex officio member of the Pension Board rather than just appoint them straight to the pension board. Um, there uh, actually was a Supreme Court case that allows a mayor uh, to serve on a city's pension board, uh, and that was litigated um, in 1980, 86 to 88, um, and it started with the city of Orlando. But um, I just wanted... To, for whoever's making the motion to be careful to use those words. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shonan. And before we discuss this, I'd like to also 
talked to my colleagues a little bit. We had discussion a month or so ago when we appointed the vice mayor to these boards, and we discovered that the only requirement is that it be a resident of Temple Terrace. It does not have to be the mayor or the city manager or the vice council member. <clears throat> and so I see on tonight's agenda that it's kind of a being presented as like I'm the only applicant for this job. And so I, I council, um, if you would prefer to advertise this and get a citizen to, to you know, see who applies rather than appoint me, I don't want to seem like we're pigeonholing you into, well, there's only one guy here. we got to appoint the mayor. So if, and you're not going to offend me, if somebody wants to make a motion to, you know, let's advertise these like we do other boards or whatever, it, I won't be offended at that. I, I mean, I would like to serve. I'm on there now. I've been on there since I took over as mayor. I, I like to pretend I add a little value to it, but there's other people that could serve just fine too. So it's up to you. You're not being... We have to make a motion on these two items, but it does not have to be to appoint me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, this is a little, doesn't fit quite right into Robert's rules, so I'm just going to open it up. I'm at, Vice Mayor? I'll make a motion to, <clears throat> to appoint uh, Mayor Ross as the ex officio member to, which one's the C, the Firefighters Pension Board uh, for the trust, as trustee. I'll second that. <clears throat> And then Kemp is the second one? Yeah, um, the fire chief Kemp is the second one. There's two. I and do apologize. The same applies to, he's, okay. not, he's not here, but he doesn't have to be appointed either. So. I thought we had to do them separately. Okay, and, and, and Chief Kemp as the uh, second uh, representative. We have a motion. Do we still have a second? Yes, we do. We have a motion. Is there discussion on the motion? Yes. Councilmember Abel. So I'm totally in favor of this. I'm, I'm going to vote yes, but I would like in the future for it to be opened up. And I mean, with you as an applicant as well, just because I, I feel better about since it's open to everybody, having that on the table instead of something that we could say, well, we don't actually want to do what's on the agenda, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I am in favor of it. But in the future, I hope that we do open it up and then have a chance to vote for, for you or whoever else is on there as well. That's fine with me. I don't have any objections to that. I won't. I, and if you'd prefer, we can do that now. I don't have any objection to that either. No, we're here. It's, it's okay to okay. proceed. Any other discussion on the motion? We, we do have a citizen on this board, don't we? We do. On both of them? Yes. Okay. Yes, we do. Okay. No, there's no further discussion. All those in favor, signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? No nays. Comments are noted. Uh, next item is the same thing for the police pension board um, and again at this case it is only me being reappointed um, my term expired in May and the proposed new term would be from June 7th tonight until June 7th 2024 and the same discussion previously applies to this too so I move to approve um, appointing Mayor Ross as the ex officio member of the police pension board of trustees second, second. I think the vice mayor got you. A motion in a second. Any further discussion? Any discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? No nays. Thank you, I think. Next item is uh, approval of the minutes from the May 17th City Council meeting. I move to approve the minutes of the May 17th, 2022 City Council meeting. Second. second. Motion in a second. <laughs> discussion corrections to the. <laughs> You got it. Okay. Any discussion of the minutes? All those in favor signify with aye. 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 The minutes are approved. Next item are persons wishing to be heard on items not listed on the agenda or items on the consent agenda. Uh, we do have a three minute time limit for all public comment. We'd ask that speakers come to the podium and state their name and city of residence. Um, during public comment, we do like to assure the public that we do take your comment seriously. Your elected officials, the city manager and directors are in attendance, uh, do follow up on these items. Uh, I currently have only one request to speak from Ms. Ellen Snelling. Welcome, Mrs. Snelling. And there are forms in the back of the room if those, if anybody else would like to. Good evening. Good evening. Do I need to move this up? It's down. 
just leave it. Okay. It should be. Um, good evening. I'm Ellen Snelling. I live at 521 Lantern Circle, and I'm here tonight to give you a, just a brief update on Delta 8 THC. Um, back in, I believe it was in March, I came and brought some things that I had purchased at local convenience stores. And just to give you a reminder, um, one of them was Skittles look, that looks exactly like the children's product, and it's got 250 milligrams of THC, and then also medicated Nerds Rope, which also looks exactly like the children's candy. Um, so after that, I did go to County Commissioner Stacy White and spoke to him and showed him my candies and said, you know, that they were popular children's candies. They looked just like them, sold in convenience stores, gas stations, smoke shops, and a variety of other stores across the county. Um, and there was no restriction on age of sale. So um, on March 23rd, it was brought to the attention of the BOCC and they voted seven to zero to look further into it and to give her an update in approximately two months, which on June 2nd, the BOCC met again and the county attorney's office gave a presentation on Delta 8 THC. For the past two months, <coughs> code enforcement and regulatory compliance of Hillsborough County has been working really hard, going to as many establishments as they can. <coughs> There's actually 500 within our county that's able to sell these products and they visited 120. And any findings that they had, they would collaborate with the State Department of Agriculture and they did as much as they could with the minimal amount of regulations that there are. So. After the report was given, um, in 90 days, there'll be more enforcement, more inspections, and continue to see where these items are placed. Are they in glass cases? Are they behind the counter? Are they age 21? Just because the stores want to enforce that themselves. Um, and they're gonna start doing education for retailers to try to tell them, you know, these products are actually really dangerous for children, especially the ones that look just like children's candy. They're gonna do a consumer outreach and try to, to educate consumers as well and on the dangers of the health for health and safety. So um, Fox 13 ran a news story about it and I, I did speak and they, they had me featured in there. So I got an email on Friday night that I just wanted to read to you. Um, Thank you for your focus on awareness on Delta 8. My 10 year old was accidentally poisoned last year at a home show in Tampa by eating an entire bag of Delta 8 Fruit Loops that he got on a vendor's table at the home show. Horrible what happened to my little guy. He went to two different hospitals and spent the night at ICU at John Hopkins. I really appreciate what you're doing. So I, you know, it was heartbreaking to hear this, but it makes me feel that, you know, we really need to do something. We, we just can't let, keep letting these children get harmed by this product. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Christine. Are there other members of the public who wish to address the council? As council members, just for your information, if the public comment is done, um, I have monitored what the county's doing with this and asked our city attorney to keep in touch with the county attorney to kind of monitor. So depending on what the county does um, and what the appropriate course of action for us as a city would be, depending on what they do, um, there may be some follow-up, there may be some, um, we may come to you for um, a decision to, to follow suit with whatever the county might be doing. So, Council Member Abel. I just had a quick question. Um, do those products have a warning label on them or are they just like candy? This is Snelling. <laughs> I, normally this is kind of a break in protocol, but nobody else has signed up to speak, so. Some of them do have warning labels. Some of them are like tiny, tiny print. It's hard to read. But like, for example, the Skittles, and I can pass it around. You can take them out and look at them, just, just so I have four left when you get it back to me, because <laughs> I don't want anybody going to the hospital. But uh, the Skittles in particular had absolutely nothing. There was no warning at all. But hopefully we can get a requirement at some point that says, keep out of the reach of pets and children. I mean, that would kind of be the least that I would like on there. Okay, thank but you. some actually have like, don't drive after using it and that type of thing, which, which is really helpful, but some have nothing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so there's probably more to come on no, this. So, so. so we're, yeah. we're watching, we're monitoring. So. Again, are there other members of the public who wish to comment to the council? If not, we'll move on to our first item is a resolution approving the annual comprehensive financial report for fiscal year ending 930 2021 Jeff Wolf CPA for more Stevens Loveless 
and finance director Lynn Boswell are here to explain. Good evening. Good evening, and uh, Jeff Wolf, our CPA and auditor for the city, will be doing a presentation. If we could have that up on the board. There you have. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, good to see everybody again, and I, and I just really wanted to thank the mayor and the council for allowing us to serve you as your external auditors. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll get right to it. We go the other way. Okay, um, for, first, uh, governmental auditing standards requires us to communicate certain items of governance, yourself being uh, governance, so this kind of slide will we'll cover that. Um, first being our responsibilities as your auditors, and our responsibility is to perform an audit in accordance with government, uh, government auditing standards and to render opinion on whether your financial statements are materially correct. Uh, management's responsibilities are to um, establish a set of internal controls to provide reasonable assurance that your financial statements are materially correct and also to prepare and take responsibility for those financial statements. So it's important to remember it's, it's management's financial statements, it's, it's not the auditors. Um, we do perform tests on internal controls and compliance. However, it's, it's really just to help us plan our audit. Um, it's not enough to render opinion on. Um, I'm happy to report there's no significant difficulties involved in the audit. Um, no unusual accounting conventions were noted during the audit. Um, no disagreements with management, and um, we completed the audit according to the schedule that was originally communicated. Um, there's one item I, I do just want to touch on, um, you know, related to the um, fraud with the uh, community development director. Um, obviously, we were aware of it um, and evaluated as part of our audit, but you probably did notice uh, it's not in any of our reports. And just briefly, just to touch on that, you know, reason for that is, um, first, um, you know, based on our inquiries, it didn't appear to be a total breakdown of internal controls. It was more related to wrongdoings of, of one person. So that was one factor. Um, second, and I'll, I'll say this very cautiously, because um, I know uh, dollar amounts to the public and to the financial statements to auditors are very different, but from a financial statement uh, purpose, it wasn't material. And lastly, um, uh, the last factor was, you know, the council was well aware of it. Everybody, you know, it was clearly in the public, so we didn't think bringing it up um, th for additional matter provide any value um, because it didn't meet the first two criteria. Now, if it was something that no one was aware, aware of it, we certainly would have included it in, at least in this, you know, what well, we are including in the presentation, but possibly in our report. So I just wanted to touch on that, you know, just not to think that we were skipping over that. We were well aware of it. And um, actually, our interim procedures for, for fiscal year 22 starts next month, if you can believe that already. Um, and this will certainly, procurement um, will certainly be a focus for next year's audit. Um, so on to the reports, and I apologize, this will be repetitive, it, it, it's consistent. Um, our first is our audit report, um, and that is whether the, the financial statements are materially correct. We did have an unmodified opinion, which I know doesn't sound great, but that is the highest level of assurance you can get that your financial statements are materially correct. Next is our report on internal control and financial reporting and compliance. Um, again, it's not an audit opinion, but if we did find a significant deficiency or material weakness, it would be located in this report. Um, again, that was a clean report, no findings noted. Um, in the current year, um, you met the federal single audit threshold, meaning you had more than $750,000 in expenditures and federal awards. So um, those reports are included. Um, th those were also clean reports. Um, the majority of the dollars related to the, the Corona Relief Fund through uh, Hillsborough County. That was the major program that was audited, and that was also, you know, again, a clean report, no uh, issues noted. Um, next report is the Auditor General Required Management Letter. Um, this letter covers a few things, such as if there was a financial emergency, we'd have to communicate that. Um, any deterioration of financial condition, which, if you remember a few years ago, um, we did have a management letter comment related to financial condition, so I, I really do want to give credit to council for rectifying that over the several years and really putting the city into a good financial position, which I'll, I'll show more in when we get to the financial slides. But um, ultimately, there was a clean management letter, no, uh, no issues noted. Lastly is our um, independence accountant report, and this just really relates to compliance as it relates to um, investments. And again, uh, no findings, no issues noted. So overall, it was a clean audit. Some real quick uh, financial highlights. Um, first being your citywide analysis, and this would be if your city was 
you know, a business, you know, uh, including capital assets, long-term liabilities. Um, again, you'll see, you know, your your unrestricted position is negative, but this is really due just to your, your pension liabilities and your OPEB liabilities. But um, ultimately, in the current year, your government activities did increase. Last year, your unrestricted, unrestricted net position as a part of total <coughs> expenses was 146% last year negative, and now it's 130, so it does continue to improve. And your business activities was pretty comparable to prior year. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Next is our, your general fund, which is your main operating fund. And this, you know, I really want to highlight the improvement. Um, if you go to your uh, assigned, unassigned fund balance as a percentage of total expenditures, this is really your reserves to uh, your ability to meet ongoing expenditures or any emergencies that arise. And uh, this year was a very strong 34.6. Um, last year was 29.1. In 2019, it was 18.4. So you really see the improvement over the three years, you know, to have it, you're in a very strong financial position in your general fund. Um, some, some highlights in your general fund budget. Um, as you can see, you um, were slightly under revenue by 1.4 million, but you're also under your expenditures by 2.9. So that results in a, in a favorable variance of 1.5 million um, compared to budget. And then lastly, on your enterprise funds, um, your water and sewer, um, pretty consistent compared to last year. Um, I'll just kind of focus on your operating income. You had uh, 1.4 in the current year in the water sewer compared to 1.5 in the prior year. Um, your sanitation had a slight loss of 0.2 million of, of operating income um, or operating loss compared to 0.1 in the prior year. So enterprise funds were pretty uh, comparable to prior year. but. Um, and that, you know, again, just in summary, you know, it was a clean audit. Um, the city um, has gone, you know, you know, we certainly had comments in prior audits and, you know, uh, Lynn's team has done a great job in getting, uh, you know, to the point where we're having clean audits and clean reports. So, but at this point, if there's any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to answer those. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Seeing none, I do have a question. I'm sure the vice mayor does too. Can we bring up slide seven again? The one before that, I think. Okay, that one. So, I'm assuming that the COVID, the CARES Act money was probably in last year. Is that is is that money the contained in this report? Yeah, the revenue would would be in was was recognized in fiscal year 21. Okay, because we got. Two million dollars. Point nine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So okay, that explains. But that would have been budgeted, so that you know that would still have been part of it. That would have been part of your final budget. So that year, I I'm not exactly you know without looking exactly what the difference is between budget and actual. But yeah, still those, <clears throat> those uh, Corona relief funds dollars expenditures and revenues would have been included in the fiscal year 21. Okay. So the thing is that was three million dollars. It kind of skews what we think of as our budget, and then now we have thirteen million dollars in ARPA money that's going to do. Next year, it's going to make everything looking. If you don't back that out, it looks like we have more money than spent more money than we really have. Right, but this this um, this uh, slide takes your final budget. So you know any budget amendment that you would have done to you know for those grant dollars would be included in those amounts. So right. yes, the dollar amounts are higher, but the the comparison isn't yeah. next. Yeah, to, you next. just have to keep that in mind when you're looking. Oh, absolutely, especially with the ARPA fund. I mean, that's going <clears> to be a, a key item. You know for the next year's audit as well. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor. Um, I do have a, a comment that I want to make. The uh, regard, you, you had touched on it briefly, Jeff, um, that, that council needs to be made aware, to, needs to really focus on, is for the last five, six audits, we, we were hammered on financial statistics, which appeared to be totally out of our control. There was nothing we could do with the economic conditions. But uh, through the efforts of the past council, this council, in, in raising our reserves and doing what we could with, with um, uh, uh, expense controls, staff, I mean, they've done a phenomenal job with, with, con with controlling costs and so forth. They all disappeared, OK? I mean, they could come back. And it's incumbent upon future councils and this one for the next budget to uh, you know, keep that in mind and keep keep control over it, but those disappearing really is a significant factor and a significant achievement 
uh, for for the administration, <coughs> for finance to, to 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 keep track of it and everything, but uh, just everybody everybody towing the same and rowing in the same direction. I think it's really really a big deal. I was surprised they were all gone. I mean, there was nothing left. So that was that was. Um, that's a very good. That's a very good thing that we need to remember going forward. We want to keep those away. Good. Thank you. Other council members. Council member down here. <clears throat> By the way, that was a choking on a peppermint. <laughs> I apologize. <clears throat> My question. I noticed the. Um, it's on page thirty-two. Um, and we've been told that the increase was coming from the city of Tampa. So is that what is that's what's reflected here is that increase in the a dramatic increase in the cost uh, for our um, sanitation fund and waste disposal is a lot of that of is it probably a combination of that cost increase plus everybody was home right so I need to read it now before I can <clears throat> then you have to come up so we can get you on television. A lot of that did have to do with the increase in the operational income, definitely, or the, the rates that you had been able to raise in being able to do that. And do note, again, the statement that there was an operating loss still in sanitation, but we, I think we knew that because we're still a little bit behind on, on that one right. part. So. <clears throat> but uh, overall, financially, though, we're doing pretty well. We're doing oh, oh, absolutely. I just yeah. want to say when we were discussing whether or not to increase based on this new cost, I mean, here it is in, in what it costs us. Definitely. So definitely. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Other questions, council members? Mm -mm. Very good. Thank you so much, Mr. Wolf. Is there a motion to approve the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report for fiscal year ending 9-30-21. I move to approve the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report for fiscal year ending September 30, 2021. Can we correct it? You can't say comprehensive annual report anymore. That is actually a forbidden comment. You have to change it to what the uh, annual um, comprehensive financial to act for. Oh, you have to say. You have to say ACFR. You can't say CAFR is a forbidden word. I wasn't going to say CAFR. ACFR. Well, let's just say like it says on here. Yeah. Annual That's what Compre I was doing. I was okay. just reading okay. it, so I'm, I'm okay. If I, okay. So I left off the, the, enact, uh, the initials. I put that back in my motion. I don't want to get in trouble for that. That's all. I don't want you to get in trouble either. So the motion is to approve the annual comprehensive financial report. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion on the motion? Uh, I do want to say one thing, um, just for everybody watching, that this is for last fiscal year that closed in September. And so our finance crew, um, our directors, and our previous city manager deserve a lot of credit for helping to produce this report. Um, good management, good control of the budget, and I appreciate that to the former city manager and our staff. So. If there's no other discussion, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? No nays. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Ms. Boswell. Next item is a resolution approving the renewal of Microsoft Office 365 licenses. And our IT director, Sally Cabrera, is here to explain. Welcome, Ms. Cabrera. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, a resolution of the City Council is requested to renew our Microsoft Office 365 licenses and support. Uh, in the amount of $76,408.20 from our vendor SHI, also known as Software House International. Payment will be provided from the general fund. The quote is based on the current Omnia Partners contract. And the increase compared to last year is due to um, employee growth. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Cabrera. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this? Seeing none, council member questions? Any questions? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the resolution? I move to approve the resolution for the renewal of Microsoft Office 365. Second. Thanks. Motion and a second. Council discussion on the motion? None. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? No nays. Thank you, Ms. Cabrera. Next item is first public hearing and first reading of an ordinance text amendment amending section 12-40 definitions. 
text 22-01 of the Land Development Code. I'll open the public hearing and ask Senior Planner Gus Carpus to explain. Welcome, Mr. Carpus. Yes, good evening. Make sure I've got my stuff ready. There we go. Uh, as the mayor uh, said, this is the first public hearing and reading of Ordinance 1527, which is a uh, land development code text amendment amending Section 1240 of the Land Development Code. Uh, back in November, the City Council adopted uh, Ordinance 1517, which uh, made some changes to the Land Development Code, which included Section 1240 uh, to provide uh, a new definition for accessory structure and to remove uh, a couple of definitions, including existing manufactured home park or subdivision and new manufactured home park or, su or subdivision. When we adopted that and we sent it to Municode to be codified, uh, it was discovered that there is a second portion uh, of the definition for new manufactured home park or subdivision uh, that had not been included in, in the text for deletion and included in Exhibit A uh, of the adopted resolution. So when I discussed this with the city attorney, uh, it was determined that the portion was too long to uh, call a Scrivener's error, so we did determine that it needed to be part of a new ordinance, which would be amending Exhibit A. So. If you look at what's up there, you've got uh, the definition, the highlighted part, which is one long run-on sentence, is the part that was missed. Uh, so that is what, uh, in essence, what we're doing is just taking off that part, but we're doing the entire change <coughs> that we did previously by amending the whole <coughs> exhibit. So again, here we, got, here we are, this is what the new exhibit would look like. The highlighted area is what would be added to Exhibit A and attached to uh, Ordinance, I believe, 1527. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so I did recommend approval of the first reading for Ordinance 1527, uh, removing the entire definition and removing the, the other definition and adding the new definition of accessory structure to section 1240 of the land development code <clears throat> do you have the definition of accessory structure on one of your slides did i miss that or was i did not include that uh it is uh, it is included hmm, but you would have to read if i can get my powerpoint back you, mean? <clears throat> you would read on the top of uh, ex Exhibit A here, uh, accessory structure is a structure on the same parcel of property as a principal structure and the use which is incidental to the use of the principal structure for the purposes of administration, uh, administration of the floodplain management ordinance, chapter 12, article 9, division 3 of this LDC. The term includes only accessory structures used for parking and storage. So this is more of uh, the floodplain ordinance. Thank you. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Council members, do you have questions for Mr. Carpus? Any questions? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Carpus. Ask the clerk to read the title of the ordinance. An ordinance of the City of Temple Terrace, Florida, relating to floodplain management, amending the City of Temple Terrace Code of Ordinances, Chapter 12, of the Land Development Code, Section 12-40, definitions, providing for applicability and severability, providing for an effective date, and repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there a motion to approve the ordinance on first reading? Move to approve the ordinance on first reading. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? No nays. Thank you. Uh, the ordinance will appear for a second reading in public hearing on Tuesday, June 21st, 2022. Next item on the agenda is a second public hearing and second reading of Ordinance 1526, amending the code by enacting a new section 2-84 in Chapter 2 entitled Complaints Against the Charter Officer. 
I'll open the public hearing and ask the city attorney to explain. This particular addition to our code will provide a more comprehensive procedure on what should be done if there is a serious allegation or evidence of wrongdoing by a charter officer. Um, previously, all that we had was uh, some procedures with regard to an allegation of discrimination or harassment. Obviously, there are other things that can be done that may not be all right, and so um, this would be a procedure that would, uh, th the highlights here are basically that would let people know that any complaint about a charter officer, officer shall be directed to the mayor who shall determine whether the complaint warrants formal or informal investigation. It states what the mayor should then do. Um, also includes promptly notifying the city council of results of an investigation. It allows the city council by majority vote to initiate investigations into conduct of charter officers as it deems necessary. It lets the charter officers know that they must cooperate fully with any investigation initiated by the mayor or city council, except when doing so would violate constitutional protections against self-crimination, and informs the charter officers that failure to cooperate with an investigation may result in termination of employment. Um, there's also a provision that would, um, since things often happen quickly um, and there's not often time to quickly have a uh, city council meeting, it empowers the mayor to uh, protect the interests of the city by placing the charter officer on a short-term paid administrative leave and requires the mayor then to immediately notify council and to convene an emergency meeting whereby the city council can then determine what the proper action is. So those are the highlights of this and uh, <coughs> council had requested that the legal department look into this, see what other uh, cities of our um, type of government were doing and as I mentioned at the last meeting we had talked to three or four different cities and found that they responded rather quizzically to us when we asked the questions about it because they didn't really have anything in place. So I didn't get a lot of guidance from other, these other cities, um, but I did discuss this with their city attorneys and you know, got some feedback on how we could proceed and <coughs> this is uh, what we've come up with, so. Thank you, Ma city attorney. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Seeing none, council member questions. Any questions? If there are no questions, I'll close the public hearing and ask the clerk to read the title of the ordinance. An ordinance of the City of Temple Terrace, Florida, amending the Temple Terrace Code of Ordinances by enacting a new section 2-84 in Chapter 2, Article 3, Division 2, Specific Officers, entitled Complaints Against a Charter Officer, Providing for Severability, Providing for Codification, Repealing All Ordinances or Parts of Ordinances in Conflict Herewith, and Providing an Effective Date. Good. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there a motion to approve Ordinance 1526 on second reading? There is. I move to approve the second reading of Ordinance 1526, amending the code by enacting a new section 2-84 in Chapter 2, entitled Complaints Against a Charter Officer. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? No nays. The ordinance is adopted on second reading. And just as a note to this, after this passed on first reading, um, shortly thereafter, there was a gathering of the Florida League of Mayors. And I brought this up to them because so many cities mm -hmm. had no way to address this. Mm -hmm. And they all said, wow, yeah. we never thought that of that. And so I shared our ordinance, and it only passed on first reading, but I shared it with... Mm -hmm the other cities in the state of Florida, and I, I don't know how many, but many of them are um, looking to adopt a similar ordinance, so. Congratulations to us. Yes. Not what I want to be known for, but I, I mean, either. it's. I don't either, <laughs> being ahead of the game. So, uh, council business, uh, I'll start this off with the draft complete streets safety action plan. City engineer, Brian McCarthy, and uh, representative from Kimley Horn are here. Welcome, Brian. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Honorable uh, City Council, Brian McCarthy, City Engineer, 
and this is probably one of the few times I'm up here not requesting funds. <laughs> I thought I was expecting that. We'll find a way. <laughs> so as part of our grant with the Florida Department of uh, Economic Opportunity, Kimley Horn and Associates uh, developed a draft um, complete <clears throat> street slash safety action plan for three corridors that we were focusing in on. So we'll just start with a 10, 15 minute presentation um, that kind of shows some of the concepts that we developed and then we'll be happy to discuss any comments, questions, uh, feedback that you may have. So today we have Jared Snyder from Kimley Horn here to uh, present to you our concept plan. Thanks so much, Welcome, Brian. Sir. Again, uh, Mayor, members of the commission, thanks for having us. Jared Schneider with Kimley Horn. Um, really excited to, to kind of go over the concepts and talk to you a little bit about that as far as, so we'll get the presentation up. Here we go. So tonight I really just wanted to kind of focus on the three corridors and, and run through first the outreach and, and what we heard from the community. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go kind of through each of the, the different corridors and talk to you a little bit about the concepts. As, as Brian mentioned, this is, you know, kudos to the city really for going after the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity grant. That was a, a $50,000 grant that the city won. It's nothing like having a, a grant from, from someone else, right? And, and the city did put a little bit of skin in the game. So, so kudos to you. It's a really um, competitive grant application. And being in, in Florida and Tampa Bay, where we have a lot of safety issues when it comes to um, travel and, and multimodal transportation, um, Tallahassee really saw the, saw the need. So really in talking with staff um, and the administration, there was these three corridors that we focused on, Druid Hills, North River Hills, and then Whiteway Drive. So we started uh, earlier this year really with the existing conditions and, and the mapping component. And then for public outreach, we had two stakeholder meetings and then a public workshop. Uh, the public workshop was held in March 22nd, and then we had our stakeholder meetings in March and, and May as well. Really, as, as far as our scope, what we came up with, these are concepts that could be really the starting point that could be applied elsewhere within the city, and then there could also be a design component. Really just, again, trying to show what, what the options are or the, or the tools in the toolbox. Um, so we're here today, obviously, as city council, and then the, the grant runs through, really we're tying up our final report through the, the end of June. Um, and then, obviously, there's, there's next steps to, to implement um, the design. So what are complete streets again? We, we use this term a lot. Really what we're, we're looking at is, is having roadways that are safe for not only those that, that drive, but for pedestrians, bicyclists, and, and golf carts. Um, and then trucks, that's something that we, we talked a lot about um, in this process and we talk about around the state in these type of plans. Um, we're considering the land use. What's, when we look at the street, what's the context? What's around the, the street? Is it, is it a neighborhood? Is it a community center or school like we have in this area? So now I'm going to kind of pivot and just give you a quick summary of the stakeholder meetings. We had, again, a stakeholder, two stakeholder meetings and then the community workshop in, in March 22nd. And Mayor, you might notice yourself in a couple of these pictures here. Um, so this was held, obviously, uh, um, in your community center. And we really heard the same theme over and over again, and particularly on River Hills and Whiteway, the speeding, aggressive driving as people try to cut through. And that's another reason why these corridors were key. With Fowler and 56th Street, um, a lot of people use, use these streets as, as kind of cut through. Um, a thing that we heard a lot about was increased education on how we share the roadway with pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more of that when we talk about the concepts. Uh, another, another thing that I found interesting um, that your community kind of picked up on this, because we talk about this around the state and the country, is looking at innovative intersection improvements. It's not just, you can't just put a stop sign and expect everybody to slow down a lot of times with these improvements. It's trying to create that that the feeling that you have to slow down. So I'll, I'll show you a couple concepts and illustrations of that. Okay, so we're gonna transition into the three corridors. I'll start with, with Druid Hills. And, and something I wanna talk about is we're gonna have a slide that talks about the overall challenges. You'll see a lot of the same themes. And then I'll talk about our initial recommendations. And, and the way we listed this really is to talk about some short-term improvements that you could do. Obviously, um, there's budgets, right? We just talked about the budget, but then there's some longer term things that you could be considering as well. Um, also with, with where we are right now from safety, there's uh, safe, I'll just say a safe streets for all and grant applications that are out there. So we had that in mind as well. So there's other federal grants to actually go for design for, for the things that the city would wanna 
look at. <clears throat> so Druid Hills, really, again, we heard a lot about the speeding, um, really more of a neighborhood feel in here, but the lack of connectivity and no, no dedicated bicycle facilities. We call them Shero. So on the right, you can kind of see you have the pavement marking there. Um, but really, again, talked about speeding. So we looked at ways to improve the sidewalks and the intersections and, and really start to feel, and you'll see this again on, on all the corridors, the, um, really the, f the feel that you have to slow down. So we, we talked about a mixture of traffic calming elements. You have about a mile section of uninterrupted travel through this um, on, on this roadway as well as white way. <coughs> so a mixture of um, speed humps or it could be uh, cushions and, and really trying to slow speeds down. And then the picture on the right, I think does a good job of it. A lot of times in traffic calming, what we're trying to do is just narrow the street so you feel you have that feel that you need to slow down. So some of that gets into the longer term improvements where you could do uh, reduced, reduced curb um, to really narrow it down. So uh, River Hills, very, very similar. Um, this is this is interesting that you have a, a bike facility on River Hills. So we we have really we looked at it from Druid Hills to Fowler, and there's you know it's great to see some improvements happening on Fowler. Not as fast as we all would like, but at that intersection, that's there's some improvements there. Um, but really, the it's got that a little bit of the open feel with, with folks mentioned kind of speeding to the school and cutting through. Um, something that we heard a lot from the stakeholders was illegal parking in the bike lanes, whether you have a ground crew, a ground crew or um, further south of White Way, um, where people have parties over the weekend, you have people parking in the bike lane. So that's something that we heard a lot about. Um, we, we also heard about pedestrians walking or biking or, or walking in the bike lane. So that was a concern. So what did we, what did we talk about? For the short-term improvements, we looked at intersection improvements again just trying to slow speeds down and we, we call them split medians and I'll I'll show you a couple examples of what we mean by that and reducing the curb radii so you can't just race around an intersection um, raise crosswalks is another tool in our, our toolbox and then just updated signage that's something that we look at a lot of times um, with these improvements a lot of times it's, it's interesting how you can you can really start to for traffic calming look at um, just street markings on the on the ground. That's that's one way to do it, or just landscaping in between the the curb and the sidewalks. Now that you know creates friction. Um, you have to look at maintenance, but that's one of the tools in our toolbox. So longer term, we looked at mini roundabouts, traffic circles, and and even a trail on the west side of this this street. Again, I'll show you can, some examples of that. So this is looking overhead. Um, Druid Hills is on your left, and then north south is is River Hills, and really just kind of showing you how you can tighten up the intersection. That's something that again you can kind of swing around the intersection pretty quickly. Talking about safety, so this is this is kind of illustrating some of the examples. Um, in the middle is what we call a split median. So again, it just tries to channelize the street, um, narrow down the, the pavement. And there's obviously, as you would move into design, you'd have to coordinate with police and, and fire on that. Um, striping the bicycle lane was something that we talked about just as a short term to show that the bike lane's there and, and um, additional signage in that area. And then it's a little harder to see, but on the right, we really looked at a lot of times just trying to bring the crossing down for the width of it. So that was one improvement idea. So this is just illustrating it. And then on uh, White Way on River Hills, so this is again tightening up the intersection. If you see the existing condition on the right, it's, it's pretty sweeping through there, so tightening up the turn radii. And then you know, this is also I'll talk about um, one comment we did hear from the stakeholders was with all of the on-street parking or people parking on-street considering taking out the bike lane and then just striping out on-street parking. Felt like you could look at that in the long term, but people are still using the bike lane, so we, we kept it in there and just focused on the striping and the signage initially. And then we also talked about long term. There was an idea of uh, a mini roundabout potentially in the long term, but that's again we didn't feel like that was a short term improvement. So this is looking at it at Street View, looking north, and uh, this kind of illustrates what I was talking about how. Obviously, you have to look at the long-term maintenance, but even just creating some landscaping between the sidewalk and the curb sometimes starts to have folks feel that, that friction and, and not have the, 
the straightaway feeling. Um, and then on the left, you could look at a potential trail over the long term. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about Whiteway, and this is one that we had a lot of, a lot of discussion on. I'd say Whiteway and River Hills were the, the, t the top two. Speeding and aggressive driving along the school particularly. Mm -hmm. We talked to staff about any kind of improvement or traffic calming you need to consider the truck considerations. Um, really the pedestrian traffic between school hours as we all know around Lewis Elementary and the community center, it's, it's pretty high through there. So that's something that's near and dear to my heart with several children of how do we, how do we improve that. You know, overall, you have a great network of trees, as we all know, and, and sidewalks. So we looked at just enhancing that. So on the right, you can see an illustration of where you can do raised crossings. Um, so that was one of our considerations here. Additional school signage and striping, we felt like that's something that, you know, as the city goes and, and resurfaces white way, that's, that's kind of the, the first, the higher, the short-term improvement. And then um, the split medians, as I talked about. And then longer term, really, we, we felt like that's where you could look at raised intersections and, and crossing improvements. So again, really focused on, on safety and crossings in this, this vicinity. This is a similar to Druid Hills. You have a mile section, really, of, of just kind of uninterrupted flow. So it's, it's looking at where can you kind of enhance um, and slow speeds down. So I'm going to show you a couple illustrations here. So this is by the school, by Montrose. And really what this is illustrating is, is kind of how you could do a raised intersection and the, or the raised crossing. And the benefits is you get the crossing and it slows, it slows speeds down for vehicles as well. And this kind of, this shows you looking west, the schools on the right. And so what that looks like in the, you know, really the benefit of this is the, the vehicles can kind of see the pedestrians are more at, at eye level. And it just, again, creates, uh, an opportunity for pedestrians to cross. So this is Gillette. You've got the community center off to the, the northeast there. And this is another example of where we really tried to tighten it up and, and talked about medians to kind of channel the speeds down. Um, in the middle, we, we didn't do a, uh, a roundabout. We put what we call our pavers in the middle. And even, even that, it creates a little bit of a raised surface and, and slow speeds down. And again, this is kind of looking, this shows you what it looks like looking west. So again, just to break up that, that straightaway. And, and I, again, just want to tell you that these are concepts as you go through design. These could be, there's a range of tools in the toolbox. So that kind of gets me to my next point, the, the next steps. Really, we felt like this is kind of an opportunity for, I know you, you all have kind of the new bike pedestrian advisory committee, using this as a toolbox to move forward on, on this street with city staff as well as other streets within the city. Um, enforcement strategies is one. We can't be in all places at all times, so we looked at some short-term improvements you could do to slow speeds down, but then also prioritizing some of those long-term improvements. And then I'd say continue just working with the advisory committee and, and the wonderful feedback we heard from some of the stakeholders. That, that was our next step. And, I, I kind of alluded to it, additional funding options. There's a lot coming out with safety improvements with $1 billion from the, the feds on the safe streets for all. So the, the kudos to you all again for creating the plan because in the future, that's what the feds are looking for is somebody that has a safety plan in place as we move forward. So with that, we're going to open up with any questions you might have. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this? None. Council member questions. Council member Abel. I just wanted some. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting, and I could really visualize a lot of those things helping a lot. But my first question was about. Um, you said a lot of things about changes to the curbing, and I was wondering what that would look like and what that means. Like for example, you said to reduce the curb radii. It seems like that would make the roadway larger and the curb kind of receded. Is that what that means? Really what we, we mean by that is that some of the intersections, you can bring the curb out. And sometimes you can do something as simple as painting the, the corner clips. You know, when you go to an intersection, you feel like you can just cut across 25 miles an hour or faster. So it's really just trying to tighten it up. So you have to look to go around the corner and, and slow down. I see. And the, is the curb extension the same thing as that? or is That's it correct. Okay. And you said something else about curb types, like changing... I don't know if that was 
the same thing or if you had a different thing to do with the curves? There are different curve types. There's some that are, and, and Brian and the engineers can talk about this, there's different types like D, F, and right now you have valley curves that are a little more open. The mm -hmm. minute you start to bring curves in, it just starts to make you feel tighter as you're driving. I see. That's okay. a little bit more of an expensive fix, and Troy and Brian probably don't want me to tell you we're going to change all the curves around the city right away, but that's, that's a tool in the toolbox. Okay, thank you. Council member down here. Thank you very much. Was, I always enjoy this conversation. Um, <clears throat> we know that you know it's inexpensive to paint, so you know that's the first thing we're going to do, right? We're going to paint everything green, put stripes on it, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I think that's great. My, um, I will say, the roundabout at uh, River Hills and Lockmore, or whatever street that is, you know, the one at the Country Club. If it weren't for the plants the palm tree and the rocks, the trucks would just drive right over it. So, unfortunately, if we put another roundabout, which I'm totally in favor of roundabouts, they definitely slow traffic down. Um, we're going to have to dress it up or make it absolutely obvious. Otherwise, that poor crossing guard who's at that corner is going to have to do more than blow his whistle, you know, because people will skirt around it. Um, my real question, though, those are comments, sorry. My real question is, what's next? Do we look to you, Brian, to say, okay, this is what we think we want to go for, and these are the things we can afford? Because even in your presentation, the difference between, you know, we have one now street mural that, that the Arts Council managed to raise the funds for, and those are great, uh, but it's not in, a, in an <coughs> intersection. And so if that's something that we should be doing, are, are you going to put together <coughs> like an A plan? This costs, I'll start with 50,000, but we know. Okay, this starts with a million, and this is the A plan, and then the B plan is 50,000 or 500,000, and this is what we could do. Like, we're, what, what's coming next? Um, so kind of what Jared alluded to, that our next steps is to this is to formulate a plan for the city, or at least for our corridors, and then we can start looking at funding opportunities. Mm -hmm. Again, the city can obviously um, use city funds within our uh, street fund to pay for some of these improvements, but <coughs> when you start looking at some of these longer-term ones, it, it does get costly. So my first focus is going to be on the short-term ones, like painting. Um, pavement markings is going to be certainly one of the easier ones to do. The raised crosswalks mm -hmm. is a, another one that's going to be relatively easy. The, uh, the curb radius, again, making it a little tighter at those intersections, certainly slow down people turning at the intersections as well. So it's just a matter of what we want to do in terms of priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you'll put together a plan of action, and then somebody is going to start writing that grant. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> okay. Vice Mayor? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. I don't want to start, start slicing and dicing little pieces, but could you go back to the River Hills and uh, White Way slide? It was in the... Okay, go back, go back one, go back one. This will, this will work. I know this isn't that, but number one, the, the split median. Um, is there enough room on any of these, any of these intersections to help, I don't know how big that is, to put something like that in there? Or will we have to expand it? Or, I mean, I, I I go through the I go through these intersections five times a day, and I, I can't see a split intersection, a split median in that being without you know everybody's tires scuffed up and running over them and yeah, everything so, else. So Brian, I talked about uh, obviously, yeah. These these are concepts you'd have to roll up design. That's about a two foot width, so you could have a nine foot lane, which is pretty narrow, right? But you could do it. Um, nine to ten foot lanes. Um, other in other areas where we've done this at St. Pete, you could bring out the curb a little bit, um, so that you could widen it. And so there's a possibility you could you could get it in. It would just be a little bit tighter. And because this intersection alone, has got what 40 buses a day going through there, and I believe the buses would be running over it all day long. Again, I don't want to slice and dice. We'll get him later on the individual particular ones, but. Um, now, it's, it, I, we were hoping, or I was hoping, that we were going to be able to use the end result of some of these studies and say, okay, this works here. Now, what about down in south, on the south of Bullard, we have an intersection here that's got a problem. 
And I know you can't address that, but Brian, keep in mind that's one of the deliverables that we were hoping to get out of this is to be able to take this here and replicate it in another part of town and 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 so forth. So you know, as, as we go forward with that, I hope we can come up with something. I don't see many of them out of out of this batch of stuff, but uh, you know, the painting obviously will work, and there'll be other areas where the painting will work. I'd be curious to see what the overall implementation. Uh, plan or scheme is going to end up being because that's going to be where the proof is whether it's whether it's going to be worthwhile or not but I'm concerned about you know the the, the, the medians and the raised and the elevated crosswalks and so forth then also with the ones on white way the buses are going to tear that up in a red hot minute if we're not if we don't build that appropriately again but it was thank you for the presentation um, it was good to see what the uh, end result came out of this what, what the deliverable looked like thank you thank you Mr. Other questions, council members? Council member Chambers. Uh, I just have uh, one question. You mentioned uh, the bike lanes on River Hills. A complaint was that uh, people park in the bike bike lanes, but we do uh, allow off street parking, so that would eliminate all the people down one side of the road or both sides if you have bike lanes on both sides from parking out in the uh, out in the road. So. I know that is a problem because I, when I bike, sometimes there's cars out there, but I kind of just weave around them. But I just am worried about residents losing their on-street parking sometimes. So. Yes, thank I you. guess it wasn't a question. That was just a that's comment. A, that's quite, that's all right. I, I have a real quick comment, and I'll be brief because some of it's already been said. Brian, the only thing I would encourage you to keep a couple things in mind. The the reduced radii at the intersections works great. DOT just did that at Fowler and 56th Street. They straighten out the right turn. So it does a couple of things. It slows you down and it puts you more perpendicular to the lane that you're turning into. Does a lot of benefits to that in that setting. But be careful in the neighborhoods of, with doing that because we have um, some of those intersections are the parade route also. So once a year, we have parade floats that we already have a challenge getting through some of our, and we don't have a lot of options for changing the parade route. And, and we, I think we have it where we want it to be. I don't think we want to change that. So remember the parade. The other thing, I th is, you've already heard this, is I don't know the exact measurement on a fire engine, but it's probably close to a Heartline bus, and a Heartline bus is 102 inches wide without the mirrors. So it's probably similar to that in the reduced radii or the extended prolongation of the curbs and, you know, keep in mind that that's not the normal user, but we do have fire trucks and school buses and, dump, or, you know, um, public works trucks and stuff. So access the community center. yeah yeah plus you know we have to claw trucks that go down there to pick up after storms and stuff like that so some of that you know I know that lane constricting is very popular right now you know everybody wants to go down to an 11 foot lane but that doesn't work it doesn't work for a heartline bus because they're eight and a half feet wide without the mirrors and so I'm assuming the fire engines got to be at least the same and the, and the garbage trucks have got to be the same width within a couple of inches so anyway you've heard it you know it I'm telling you your job I shouldn't do that so I'm going to make a comment on that I think let's make it difficult for everybody but the garbage trucks and the fire trucks because we've seen trucks on uh, Inverness that have no business being there okay they're just cutting through that neighborhood so that they can get back out to 56th street and not have to you know go the traffic route you know so so the, some some truck traffic it we have to have obviously you know we want the food to be delivered to the country club right so we can all have lunch but so yes we need it but not in all the neighborhoods and that's where we're seeing it quite a bit is in the residential neighborhoods along the golf course and places like that so you know, the guys get comfortable cutting through there. So let's make it uncomfortable. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Thank you, Brian. Always a pleasure. And you're right. You didn't ask for any money tonight. Oh, but he alluded <laughs> to it. <laughs> I don't more money to. Is there other carryover council business? I do, too. Vice I Mayor. Question, Sherry, from the last meeting. Any luck with the... Uh, up they're, they're, they're gathering them together for me. I told them I needed them for the budget meetings. Okay. So 
Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Other council business? Mm -hmm. Carry over council okay. business. Council member. Um, first of all, I just want to congratulate uh, Carl and his staff and Corey and, and uh, Phil. Um, understand that um, they've been working with the chamber to really get the word out about the parade and that the applications are really starting to come in. That's exciting. Um, and, of course, you promised this year that there'd be no rain. Is that right? Yeah. You personally, <laughs> listen, don't, yeah, exactly, exactly. We're having a parade no matter what, right? So anyway, I, it's, it's fun to see that the, the applications are coming in. Um, I also want you to know that I have some questions for council. So the Centennial Committee has now met twice. And the first time, you know, it was a matter of, hello, hello, who are you? Who's the chair? But this last meeting, they really got, they asked a lot of questions, which, made me say I needed to come back to you and find out. You know, the school support committee, we give them a nice, healthy budget, and they give away money in a highly regulated fashion. I mean, there's a the do's and don'ts of getting a grant, using the grant, not, if you don't use it correctly, you have to give the money back. I mean, there's some very highly regulated, that, that committee. But this committee right now, they asked a lot of questions, like, you know, how they didn't know how much money they were going to have, and I didn't either, okay, and we'll figure that out at the budget time. But they also asked questions about, like, you know, how do they decide on a project? How do, what do they do? How much oversight do you want, uh, do we want as a council, and how much and how do they, should they present those things to you? I mean, they're looking at everything from um, creating a new logo for the um, committee, which, of course, will then be used by the city and the city's logo and, you know, all those things are going to have to work together. And um, Ms. Hayes is working on that with them. But um, so do you, do we want to be the ones who say, yes, we bless this logo, or are we going to let this committee bring it to us. Same thing with expenditures. If they decide that they want to invest in anything as small as, you know, t-shirts to flags you hang at a business or, you know, those things are, there's going to have to be a process for that as well as fundraising. So uh, I am meeting with Dr. Spina and we're going to talk about a lot of these questions because, you know, I'll, I'll rely on him. But I just want you to know that that those things are being uh, considered and, and asked. I thought they asked some really good questions about how do we spend money? How do we ask for money? How do we, you know, because there's a whole process on these restricted funds, how to, how to get access to it. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I, it, it, was a, it was a good, robust meeting. It went on much longer than I think any of them <laughs> expected it to. And uh, they'll be meeting again in August, and then they're going to go August, September, October, and November. So really get some things done before the end of this year so that they can start putting some things into place 23, 24, because they really only have two years. And then 25 is it. They have to be ready. Everything has to be in place. So um, I just I want you all to be thinking about how much oversight uh, council wants. I know when we came up with the, wasn't we, I wasn't on the council at that time, but when the city came up with a new logo, I mean, it was adopted, but it took, James, I know you were here because at the time you were coming to all the meetings, just like I was with the chamber. It took several meetings for the council to say, we like this idea, tweak this, put a comma here, take a comma out, put the word there, you know, whatever. So whether we like it or not, this has been approved by council, and I'm sure that we will expect to do that again as we go forward so well council correct me if you have a different view but i think probably the the wisest thing to do at this juncture would be for you to meet with the city manager um and perhaps steve you meet with if they have a chair or mm -hmm. um and kind of come up with some recommendations I, I think what we would be smart to try to avoid is just brainstorming here all Oh yeah. All five of us and 
all five of them and you and it, it just turns into trying to build a horse by committee we're not going to get anywhere but if if you i think the answer is that we will have to talk in the budget mm -hmm. meetings yeah. about a, a budget mm -hmm. and we will i'm sure the council is going to want some, to give a thumbs up or down on any logo that's yeah. going to be i mean we're not going to want that without some oversight of that but the types of I mean, we don't need the council getting down in the weeds as to exactly what event we're going to have a concert on Friday and just on Saturday. We don't need to do that. But the kind, the types, the kinds of things that we are kind of envisioning would probably be good so that they're going, clearing the same forest that we want cleared and not, you know, they want to have an ice cream social and we want a gala, you know. So, but maybe the first step is for you guys to kind of talk. We're, we'll meet next week. Yeah. <clears throat> that sound reasonable, Council? Yes. And then at some point, once this is shaken a little further down the funnel, then it comes back to us and we give it a blessing and say, yeah, you're going the right direction. I just want to say to each of the Council members, uh, you appointed wisely. It really smart, intelligent, engaged uh, members of this committee. So good. it was good committee meeting. Other Council business? Carry over council business. New business and board reports. Nothing to report. If you have nothing to report, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to show you a three minute video. This video, it's several months old now. This is a video that I saw at a, I don't remember, it was a tourism development council meeting or Visit Tampa Bay meeting. It was one of the meetings that I attended and this was, the video was made by Visit Tampa Bay. Then they make a lot of videos and they're really, really good. They make you want to move and move back here. They're, you know, they make you want to go out to eat. They're just, in fact, they're the ones that I asked to, to highlight Temple Terrace at some point and they did. So they make really good videos. This was something that they put together and I'm sorry we lost our public. I hope we have a good audience on television because my object in showing this is I want everybody to get a better idea of why visitation, um, business conventions, even if they occur primarily in Tampa or at least outside of Temple Terrace, why they are so beneficial for us as a region. And it's not, it's not all that money doesn't stay in Tampa or doesn't stay in Brandon. It, this is county wide. So do you have the video, Cheryl? If you can put that up, it's three minutes. Every day, thousands visit Tampa Bay. And with so many ways to play, they each hunt for treasure in their own special way. Yet they all have one thing in common. Everywhere they go, they break out their loot and they're happy to pay. So how do we calculate the total impact of tourism to our region? The answer goes much deeper than you think. Come along as we measure the treasure for three different visits to Tampa Bay. Meet the Fenways from Boston, a family of five that likes to live large and soak up the sun. Overnight guests like the Fenways account for about 40% of all visits to our area, yet they make up almost 70% of our tourism spend. We like the Fenways. On their very first trip to Tampa, they spared no expense, spreading their wealth on a wide variety of vacation fun. From water taxi rides, to Hyde Park Village, from boating and biking, to rooftop bars. All this income is recognized as direct revenue fueling our tourism industry. Every year, Tampa Bay sees around $5 billion impact our economy this way. Valuable treasure that flows into our region and never leaves. But our story goes deeper than just direct dollars. Meet the Chicago Sun Dazzlers, a dance club joining us all the way from the Windy City. These pint-sized prancers and their instructor are warming up for a big show tonight. In addition to the direct sales impact the dancers bring to Florida, there's a second and secret world of revenue to discover. You see, hotels have to hire workers. Restaurants need chefs. Attractions run on electricity. And museums need security. Hey, get off the lawn. From basic supplies to professional services, Tampa Bay can't stay open without an army of local businesses backing it up. These are the indirect economic impacts of Tampa Bay tourism. Every year, our hospitality indirectly generates another $1 billion in sales revenue, and that deserves an encore. But we're still not done. Say hello to the Roaming Rooster Society. 
here to pay homage to our fine feral feathered friends for their annual convention. They're also here to help us understand what's called induced economic impacts of our region. I want it. I'll take it. I will treasure this forever. You see, all this commerce, all this cash flows downstream, impacting every citizen of Tampa Bay, creating new jobs, increasing wages, improving real estate values, generating tax revenues, mitigating insurance costs, and raising our overall standard of living. In fact, all this treasure contributes to one of Florida's biggest perks. Tampa Bay enjoys additional induced revenues to the tune of over a billion dollars a year. That's a ton of treasure. All told, Tampa Bay realizes over $4.6 billion every year flowing into our economy, showing us how tourism connects everyone as a true measure of our good fortunes and that every tourist can find their treasure when they visit Tampa Bay. Excellent. So those numbers are, when they talk about Tampa Bay, that's actually Hillsborough County they're talking mm -hmm. about. That doesn't include St. Pete, Pinellas, that's a difference. So those are Hillsborough County numbers. And so a lot of people think, well, you know, Temple Terrace isn't traditionally a tourism destination per se, which is true, but when Tampa has that convention center full, that's good for all of us, including Temple Terrace. And the boards that we serve on, the Cultural Assets Commission and Tourism Development, the Heartline, all that stuff, it's all tied together. And so I, I just wanted to show that because when I saw it, I'm like, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize the benefits that are derived from that. Um, so anyhow, <coughs> is there other new business or board reports? So yes. I add one comment to that. Sure. Uh, last year, the... Temple Terrace Arts Council applied for a grant through the uh, uh, cultural asset and we were granted just a little less than $10,000 and this week we were asked for photos of the event because they want to highlight some of their more successful grant awardees so that that was that's really something that you know we were just happy to get the the grant and now we're re being recognized as, you know being a so, so we should be aware that those things do trickle down to us. You know, it used to be that everybody thought the money never came to Temple Terrace, but you know, they, they've broadened their scope now. So that's a good thing. Right. We're good. Other new business board reports? Seeing none. City manager's report. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Thank you. I have two items tonight. First, uh, as we discussed earlier this evening, uh, Juneteenth, is, Juneteenth is a federal holiday and it's also a city holiday. Um, this year, all city employees will be paid holiday pay or have a day off, uh, except for the collective bargaining unit of the police department, police officers, corporal sergeants. And um, I would like to recommend that they be included in the holiday pay this year as well. Uh, they're not included because it's not in their contract and it's being negotiated at this time. But uh, I felt like all employees should have the holiday. What about the fire union? It's inc included in their contract, so they'll be recognized. Can, can we give them that without having a discussion with them? I think so. <laughs> well, I tried to give unions a raise one time and I had to open up a renegotiation in order to give them something. In the past for yes for Christmas Eve mm -hmm. is a prime example. There was a time when the, there, were, there was a process that was utilized called coming in with a, a memorandum of understanding but it's been long established now for the past several years that if council was made a request for something like Christmas Eve that, that that was granted by council and without the need of a memorandum of understanding it's a benefit that they're receiving and it doesn't require any, any MOU per se. Uh, you could go through the formal process but we haven't done that for a number of years. So it's completely up to you. And then uh, as far as the accounting for it, that would be something we would work through with finance in the same manner that, that we have in the past with those, that those other incidences where council uh, chose to provide that benefit to a union member when it, when it wasn't otherwise uh, offered to them because of their contract. Okay. okay. Do you need, do you need a motion? We, we do need a motion. To approve. Move to approve. Uh, Extending June. Well, he's got to finish with the motion. 
<laughs> Move to approve the uh, Juneteenth holiday to include the uh, police. Okay, thank you. I second that motion. Okay, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed, no nays. Thank you. If they have any objections. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you laugh, I'm serious, I tried to give Unionized people a, a raise one time, and we had to open up a wage reopener because the union said, "No, no, no, you can't do that." Okay. I know. The second item I have is to request we have a special CRA meeting uh, at five o'clock on June twenty-first. We need the uh, CRA board to approve the uh, CRA audit, and um, and we'd also like to talk to you about uh, possible incentives in the CRA district this year. So that's all right with you. We would like to schedule that. It is, although I will not be here on June 21st. Mm. So I'd like right to now. be here for the discussion about the incentives. Um, is that time sensitive or can that be put off another? That could be put off. I don't mind the audit. I, I don't mind missing that. I'm not, you know, the vice mayor is more qualified to advise on that anyway than I am. But. I would like to be here for the incentive. Yeah, the incentive God issue is happen. pretty important. You need to be here. Yeah, you need to be here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll postpone that. Yep. We can do, do the second. We have to do the audit. Okay. But we can. We can. No. I'm, I'm available for the 21st. We have we have to do the audit because the audit has to be submitted to the state by June 30th. Well, that's what I'm saying. The audit has to happen. So we need to do that. We can delay the, the incentive until everybody's here. That works. That works? Yes. It works. Okay. Are you okay good everybody? So tell me what we ended up with. We're going, you're going to meet yeah. on the 21st okay. and have the, dis the, do the audit, approve the, the audit. audit. Yeah, but and not the, the other the incentive discussion. discussion we will schedule to a later okay. date. Well, I okay. thought I heard it's one of Correct. We, I said five, but we could probably do it at 530. 530, that'd be Yeah, quick. if you're not going to have the incentive discussion. That'd be quick. Right. Okay, 530. And we could call a special meeting just to have the incentive discussion mm -hmm. if you don't want to wait a full quarter. Okay. Right. All right. All right. Thank you. And the incentive discussion could take longer than an hour. That could take, that could take a little longer. A long while, time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? That's all I have. City Attorney. Council members, anything? Go Bolts. Anything at all? Directors? Okay. Very good. We're adjourned.